is Catherine Lontock, and I am the Public Outreach Manager here at the American Society for Microbiology. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone who's in attendance in the room and everyone watching online to um, the latest event in ASM's Microbes After Hours series. Tonight, we are very excited um, to feature two complimentary talks on vaccine development. Our first speaker, Dr. Meredith Wadman, is a veteran medical journalist who has written for Nature, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she is currently a staff writer at Science. Dr. Wadman earned her medical degree at the University of Oxford, where she was a Rhodes Scholar, and her master's degree in journalism from Columbia University. Um, tonight, she will be discussing her new book, it just came out a few weeks ago, uh, The Vaccine Race, which chronicles the development of the first widely used normal human cell line in the 1960s, um, as well as the development of important viral vaccines, such as the rubella vaccine, um, using that cell line. Our second speaker is Dr. April Killikelly, um, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Vaccine Research Center just down the road at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, um, which is part of the National Institutes of Health. She earned her PhD in structural biology at New York University. Um, and tonight she will be discussing modern vaccine development strategies and um, her ongoing uh, research um, that is aiding efforts to develop a vaccine for a respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV. Um, and if you are not familiar with that, it is the most common cause of pneumonia in infants. Um, so, following each talk, we'll have about five to 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, for those of you that are in the room, you're gonna line up at that mic uh, to ask your questions. For those of you watching online, you can either put your question in the YouTube chat box or on Twitter using the hashtag ASMLive. Um, following both talks, um, we're, we'll have a reception outside and Dr. Wadman will be signing copies of her book, which we have available for purchase, um, credit or debit only, sorry. Uh, all right. Thanks, Catherine. It's a pleasure to be here with you all, and I'm particularly grateful to ASM for organizing this, to Catherine and the staff who've put a lot of hard work into it. And I'm especially glad that you're here on such a beautiful evening. Um, so, The Vaccine Race, why write a book with that title? Well, it actually began with another book, which many of you are probably familiar with. The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which I just devoured and found completely fascinating. And a couple years after it came out, it spurred what's called in Science Magazine a policy forum where a couple of groups of scientists were basically putting opposing views uh, in writing as to whether patients should be reimbursed when leftover bits of their tissue are turned into lucrative inventions. And that ran in science in July of 2012. And a couple months later appeared this letter. Can you all see the screen all right? Is it? OK. All right. Um, from someone called Leonard Hayflick, who I had never heard of, which probably doesn't mean a lot, because he's very well known to both microbiologists and aging researchers. At the time, I was a reporter for Nature. And what he wrote was, essentially, well, the HeLa cells are getting all the attention, but in 1962, I derived the WI38 cell line from an aborted Swedish, uh, fetus from Sweden, and it's been used to make vaccines that have protected hundreds of millions of people, and it was the object of a big intellectual property fight between me and the NIH in the 1970s. And it's still disputed as to who owns self-replicating cell lines. And I thought, wow, you've got abortions and vaccines and an intellectual property fight all in one episode. Like, how come no one's written a book about this? And I was on the phone to Hayflick a couple days later and said, is there an untold story here? 
And he said, is there ever? <laughs> he, uh, he lives in Northern California on these beautiful bluffs at a place called the Sea Ranch. And I was able to go out shortly thereafter and visit him and spend many hours hearing his story, which took me back to the late 1960s to this place called the Wistar Institute of Anatomy and Biology, which is an independent institute uh, built in the 1890s, uh, tucked away on prime real estate in the heart of the University of Pennsylvania campus. Now, it had been a moribund place in the late 50s, occupied only by a sort of under the radar illegitimate fertility clinic and run by the acting director who had some issues with uh, his management style, shall we say. And then several aging in their 80s scientists, junior scientists came and went very quickly because it was clear that the Wistar was kind of a dead end place. Well, along into the Wistar in the late 50s came the character in the middle of this photo, Hilary Kaprowski, a larger than life sort of Epicurean Polish emigre who not only was a brilliant virologist, but was a concert level piano player who had nearly pursued that route to a career. He took over the Wistar and turned it from this dead kind of creepy mausoleum into a thriving crossroads of virology where he recruited Nobel caliber scientists. And that's what the place was like in the early 1960s, shortly after he hired Len Hayflick, then age 30, no, not even 30 at the time he was hired in 1958, but by 1962, uh, age 34. Now, Len Hayflick was from the southwest neighborhoods of Philadelphia, a working class sort of Irish Jewish area, up by the bootstraps kind of guy, very ambitious, but not um, hugely cultivated. And in the era, uh, a lot of the outstanding research scientists were brought to the US by people like Hilary Kapowski from Europe. And Kapowski kind of, it's thought, looked down on American scientists. And he certainly didn't think a great deal of Hayflick, whom he hired to be a cell culturist, to sort of a, a supporting actor to the star cast of virologists who, who occupied the upper echelons of the Wistar Institute. So Hayflick's job was to get cells ready for these guys and to pass them over. Um, but he was really ambitious and wasn't going to be just in a servant's type of role. And he began to experiment on the side. The really hot question at the time was whether viruses could cause cancer. And across the street at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, um, there was a out, outspoken king of the hospital named Isidore Schwanner Rabd and a hard charging surgeon who was happy to work with the star to provide uh, all manner of tissue samples to the researchers there. And Hayflick began to receive fetuses from abortions uh, on a regular basis and to try to grow those fetal cells in culture. He wanted fetuses because he wanted to uh, make sure that the tissues he received were not contaminated with the kind of viruses that you or I might have after walking on the surface of the earth for many years. Fetuses were, as things went, relatively pr protected in the womb. How were these abortions happening, by the way? Abortion was a criminal offense in all 50 states at the time. And in Pennsylvania, there was not even an exception for the life of the mother. Well, there was a sort of parallel universe in major academic medical centers where authorities tolerated abortions being performed by medical doctors for when they ascertained or when they judged that they were needed for medical reasons. So that's what happened. Anyway, Hayflick began cultures of these fetuses, which he received at irregular intervals. And after a time, he realized that the older cells the fetus, from the fetuses he had got longest to go were dying in their lab dishes. And he was like, why? Because the, the wisdom at the time was that cells properly cultivated in the lab should grow forever. And he eventually came to the conclusion that that was plain wrong, even though it was touted by the, you know, all the highest biologists in, US, in the US at the time and around the world. And so he published this really iconoclastic paper that said, no, cells age and die in the lab, just like human beings do eventually. And I, I should preface that by saying normal cells age and die in the lab, because cancerous cells, by definition, obviously uh, are immortal. So th that got Hayflick a lot of pushback, but he was 
very determined and he was a complete um, maverick. He was not willing to be quiet or to, he, he enjoyed challenging authority essentially. So his next exploit, I guess is a fair way to put it, was to develop a, a cell line from an aborted fetus and it became a little difficult with the surgeons at Penn after a while who were not really thrilled with Last viewed, sorry, I'm having trouble advancing the slides here. Anyone want to jump up and see what I've done? Let's see, next, how about? Oh, there we go. Okay, so there was another reason that Hayflick wanted to develop a brand new pristine cell line in 1962, and it was this. Oh, sorry, those are, the, those are the cells, young on the left, old on the right, that he realized died in their lab dishes, so you can see how disorganized and essentially elderly the cells on the right are. And when they hit that sort of aged, what he called senescent point, that's when they hit what has come to be known as the Hayflick limit, which is very well known to anyone with an interest in aging. And his discovery of the Hayflick limit opened up the whole field of the study of, human, uh, of, of cellular aging, which eventually led to a Nobel Prize related to telomeres and telomerase in, 19, or, uh, in 2009. But I'm getting sidetracked. Um, why would he want to derive a new clean human fetal cell line in 1962? The answer begins with the rhesus monkey. Rhesus monkey kidney cells were used in the 1950s to grow both the Salk and later the Sabin polio vaccine. Um, you need, uh, just really brief, uh, I hate to call it a lesson, because but whatever, viruses need cells in order to reproduce themselves. They invade the cell, they hijack its machinery, and then the cell spews out num numerous copies of the same virus. So to make a vaccine in the day, they would take, in the case of the Salk vaccine, polio virus, grow it in uh, monkey kidney cells, produce masses of it, and then kill it with formaldehyde. You could also weaken a virus, uh, as in the case of the Sabin vaccine, um, after, uh, by growing it through generations in the lab in, in monkey kidney cells. Okay, so what's the problem with monkey kidney cells? Well, in 1959, this unsung woman on the left named Bernice Eddy was working in NIH's vaccine safety division. Um, NIH at the time was the gatekeeper of the US vaccine market. It wasn't FDA in the day. And she discovered, working with some of the kidney cells used to grow polio vaccine, a silent monkey virus that when it was injected into laboratory hamsters was uniformly lethal. Well, this was of tremendous concern to regulators, but they kept it quite quiet among themselves until in the summer of 1961, the National Enquirer of all papers broke the story that, lo and behold, the tens of millions of school children who had been vaccinated since 1965 with the Salk polio vaccine, many of them had also received this silent monkey virus, SV40, that was lethal in laboratory hamsters. Well, that was uh, very problematic. And Hayflick entered and said, well, look, I have got this new cell line that is called WI38, comes from lungs from a single aborted fetus. And here, I, my slides are a little out of order. So 1962, this really interesting and equally iconoclastic Swedish gynecologist performed a single abortion, and the fetal lungs were provided to Hayflick through a connection between Kaprowski, the head of the Wistar, and the head of virology at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. That's why this abortion originated in Sweden, where it was legal at the time. So Hayflick re receives these lungs, fetal lungs, from Sweden, and he derives WI38. And in the summer of 1962, he creates 800 of these ampules, each with one to three million cells, uh, fetal lung cells in it. Each of those cells capable of dividing, uh, they had divided through nine generations, so they had another 41 that they could divide through, essentially, because the Hayflick limit is about 50 uh, cell divisions. What's amazing is you could freeze these cells at nine divisions and take them out a year or a decade or 40 years later, and they would somehow, in quotes, remember how many times they divided previously, and they'd begin dividing again through another 41 divisions. So 
in essence, because of the power of exponential growth, Hayflick had created a, a, a cell line that was, for practical purposes, infinite. He did not count on the opposition of one unaccountable, inscrutable uh, regulator, Roderick Murray, who essentially ran the division at NIH that approved vaccines for market. His, his decisions could not be appealed, and he was in the job, it appeared, indefinitely. He'd already been there for seven years in 1962, and he would be there for another 10 years. He was this really buttoned-down guy, and he did not talk about his thinking, but he had all the power to say yes or no to certain vaccines and to certain substrates, in other words, cells to grow vaccines in, and he did not want Hayflix WI-38 cells to be used for vaccine making. It's not at all clear why. He left no written record. It's fairly certain that it wasn't for religious re reasons and because the director of NIH was a very devout Catholic and he would offer prayers at various building dedications and so on and Murray would be seen to sort of roll his eyes. So it's not thought that he had religious opposition. He was probably extremely worried that Hayflick cells would eventually turn cancerous and could might cause cancer in vaccinees. Why he thought this was a, a worse problem than the silent monkey viruses that inhabited monkey kidney cells is not clear. But Europeans soon embraced Hayflick cells for vaccine making, but they went nowhere in this country because of Roderick Murray's opposition. I'm going on way too long. I'm going to cut to the chase. There was a big rubella epidemic in 1964, which I'm happy to answer questions about. Rubella, like Zika, devastates fetuses. If a pregnant woman gets it in her first trimester, um, it's almost... 90 to 100% sure to do fetal damage. These kids were born blind, deaf, with heart defects, um, with intellectual disabilities, uh, many other problems, and often combinations of these problems. And you can imagine um, with a historic epidemic of, of unprecedented proportions, pregnant women in the absence of a vaccine or women who thought they might be pregnant were really scared, especially since between a half and two-thirds of people infected with rubella, also known as German measles, did not show evidence that they were infected. So it was a really scary time to be a woman of childbearing age in the U.S. And that set off a vaccine race, which Stanley Plotkin, Hayflick's contemporary at the Wistar Institute, a young pediatrician, soon jumped into with both feet, racing to use Hayflick's WI-38 cells as mini vaccine factories uh, to generate a rubella vaccine. He quickly did this in 1964. He captured the vaccine virus. What happened was he was one of the only doctors in Philadelphia who knew how to run this very obscure and new blood test that would tell a pregnant woman, woman whether or not she in fact had contracted rubella. And so he was besieged with these pregnant couples and women coming to him on the room on the side of his lab at the Wistar saying, please test, test us, see, you know, test my wife. Should, should we go ahead with this pregnancy? And when results came back positive that she had been infected, Plotkin would ask, could I, if you choose an abortion, could I um, receive the fetus? And so he received 31 fetuses in the course of 1964. And from one of these, the 27th, uh, he captured the rubella virus that he then weakened in Hayflick's WI-38 cells to produce the vaccine that was ultimately approved after Roderick Murray's departure um, in 1979 and has been used to vaccinate American toddlers ever since. It's also used in virtually all the rest of the world and succeeded in wiping out rubella in the Western Hemisphere in 2015. There are still occasional cases that are imported from abroad. Um, the testing of Plotkin's vaccine, like so many uh, trials at that time, was conducted on an institutionalized populations. Archbishop John Joseph Kroll of Philadelphia, who incidentally was adamantly opposed to abortion, but Plotkin didn't tell him how he developed his vaccine, signed off on testing on one and two-year-old toddlers at this uh, southwest Philadelphia orphanage called the St. Vincent's Home for Children. And after that, after he had sort of run through that population of captive test subjects, he moved out to a, a Pennsylvania state home for intellectually disabled kids and further tested the vaccine there. Plotkin was not an outlier in this regard. Virtually all major scientists in the US were using these populations of essentially powerless people. Um, it's, it was very sobering to me in the course of researching this book to discover just how widespread this was. 
So after years of work and resistance in 1979, Plotkin's rubella vaccine becomes the R in Merck's MMR vaccine. And the first uh, vaccine of any kind made in WI38 cells and approved for market in the US was approved in 1972. It was a polio vaccine made by Pfizer with WI38 Hayflick emblazoned on the side. Um, Another cell line was developed using Hayflix methods in London in 1966 from an aborted fetus called MRC5. And between these two cell lines, all of these vaccines have, uh, are still to this day made, propagated in these two cell lines, measles, rabies, adenovirus, hepatitis A, chickenpox, shingles, and polio. In all, more than six billion vaccine doses have been made in these two cell lines. And I'm going to bring it to a rapid halt because I think I'm going over, but I'd be delighted to answer any questions. Can you fast forward to some of the updates uh, that have resulted from? Um, you mean fast forward in time? Sure. Definitely. I thought you meant through the slide deck. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not totally understanding your question. Well, there were certain diseases that apparently have been either mitigated or eliminated in the last couple of uh, decades. Sure, well, polio is nearly gone. It's still present in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Nigeria, I believe. Um, that's the closest to victory that I can think of apart from smallpox, but smallpox has been gone for decades. Um, rubella is still, damages 100 and roughly 100,000 newborns around the world every year. Only 72% of countries have it as a part of their childhood vaccination schedule. Um, many of them are in uh, parts of Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, it's kind of ironic because Zika has damaged up to getting close to 3,000 fetuses, but this silent group of 100,000 every year, rubella babies are really not on anyone's radar. Oh, Ebola, right. I'm going to leave Ebola to April because she's much more kind of in the now. Hello. Um, what do you think about parents these days who don't want to get their children vaccinated? Um, I'm very troubled, and I think that that movement is growing, if not larger in numbers, certainly more vocal, uh, helped by the occupant of the Oval Office to a degree. and. I think it's understandable in parents who did not grow up in the battle days or don't have a memory of the battle days when you would see kids in iron lungs with polio or you know lose toddlers to diphtheria or measles invading their lungs. Um, it's easy to get complacent. And in this sense, vaccines are a bit of victim of their own success. I think that so there, I think there's a group, there's sort of a division among vaccine resistors. There are people who are totally dug in and will not vaccinate their kids. And you can talk till you're blue in the face about the evidence for vaccines being safe and effective, and it won't change them. Then there are so-called vaccine hesitant parents. They may be young. They may be new parents. They may have heard Donald Trump did something with what or what, you know, they, they may just hear the urban myth about autism, which is totally redundantly disproven. But um, be worried, but not dug in. And I think for those folks, it's really important to listen with empathy, to urge them to talk with their pediatricians, which is one of the few approaches that has been found successful in persuading vaccine-hesitant parents. Um, I think evidence is really important, but I think listening and affirming is important too, like affirming fears, because who of us who's ever been a parent hasn't been afraid for our child's health at some point or for their safety? So I, I hope that, does that begin to answer? Um, this question comes from Courtney J on YouTube. What do you see in regards to the potential further use of WI38 in the future? Well, it's kind of ironic because Len Hayflick got in trouble with the federal government in the mid-1970s because he developed the WI-38 cells under a contract with the NIH, and the contract stipulated that when it was up, that title to all materials developed on the contract would 
passed to the federal government, and he didn't like that idea, so he packed all the remaining WI-38 ampules into a liquid nitrogen refrigerator, which looks a bit like a 100-pound bomb minus the wings, strapped it into the back seat of the family sedan beside his kids, and drove off to a new job at Stanford 3,000 miles uh, from the Wistar Institute, leaving the Wistar, and particularly Hilary Kaprowski, fit to be tied. Um, this all came back to bite him in the mid-70s when the NIH descended on him with an investigation um, and repossessed all the cells. It turned out that many of them had been contaminated. Hayflick hadn't used antibiotics in initially preserving them because there was some worry at the time that antibiotics would spoil them for vaccine making because people might have allergic reactions to the antibiotics. So he took a calculated risk in not using them, but some, many of the ampules were contaminated. However, when the government repossessed them, um, it emerged that there were a dozen or so ampules that were not contaminated. The, the government, the FDA particularly, expanded those ampules slightly and froze them under 24-hour protection at the American Type Culture Collection where they reside to this day. There's about 80 vaccine-ready ampules of cells, WI-38 cells that have divided only about 12 or 13 times and could readily be used for vaccine making, but few if any manufacturers seem to be aware of that or to be anxious to use them, even though they're sterile and vaccine ready. So they're there. Um, is there a consensus or a policy on the ownership of cell lines? Oh, I'm afraid you may be beyond my pay grade here. I, they definitely have owners. I don't know that there would be a consensus on whether they should be owned. I think there's a pretty vocal contingent that, for instance, the Lacks family suing Johns Hopkins last week, or several of them, not all of them, but her oldest son, Lawrence Lacks, and his daughter, son, rather, and daughter-in-law, suing Johns Hopkins to try to recover some compensation for the creation of, of the HeLa cells. So there are arguments on both sides of, of whether uh, donors should be compensated, but I'm afraid I can't answer your question direct on whether there's one uniform policy about ownership. Certainly since 1980, when the Supreme Court um, ruled that life forms could be patented, it's possible to patent and have title in a cell line. I don't know, if m maybe that's what you were wondering. Hi. Um so I noticed on the list of vaccines, oh, I noticed on the list of vaccines made using the WI-38 uh, cell line, there were only like six or seven. Is there a reason why that uh, line is still not being used today to develop new vaccines? You know what, I think the technology has moved on. I think that's probably a better question to put to April. Yeah? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lob that one over to her. She'll be better prepared to answer it. But. I, I think, in a sense, the, the technology has moved past using, using them, in many instances, anyway. Hello. Uh, thank you, Catherine, and for the rest of ASM for uh, hosting me today. My name is April Kilikelly, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Vaccine Research Center. It's buried in a lot of acronyms, uh, but uh, if you need to find me, there's like one Kilikelly. Uh, so <laughs> that's great. So, oh, uh, and today I'm going to talk about um, not necessarily vaccine race, um, but the vaccine marathon uh, from the 1960s today and through tomorrow. Okay, so Meredith just did an amazing job describing science in the 1960s, and I'm going to contrast that to uh, science today. Uh, I'm at the NIH, and I'm showing here, I don't know if you can see, but um, this is the NIH campus right there, and these are several, some, uh, several of my coworkers, some of whom are here today. And uh, I just want to emphasize that science is very collaborative, and all the data I present is not mine alone, far from it. 
Okay, so the Vaccine Research Center, its mission is to conduct research that facilitates the development of effective vaccines for human disease. It was started by way of trying to create a vaccine for HIV, and it's since uh, branched out from there, and I'll get to that a little bit later. So I'm first going to start by contrasting three ways in which 1960s science really differs from today. So the first difference um, is the funding environment. So this graph shows uh, NIH funding as a portion of GDP. And in the, area, in the era that um, Meredith's book covers, 1960s through the 1970s, I think there was like a hundredfold or something jump in NIH funding, just unbelievable. And uh, when I read the phrase, uh, we used to refer to the National Institutes of Health as the National Institutes of Wealth, I laughed out loud. Um, because today, it's very different. Um, from the 1970s through, um, can you see? Yeah, through today, um, it, it's been pretty stagnant up until the 2000s when there was, again, an, a funding boost. But today, we really see a decrease or a stagnant budget. So you can imagine how this would really, this really does impact innovation and scientific development. The second difference uh, is clinical testing in vulnerable populations. This is, I think, the second time you're seeing this picture from Meredith's book. Um, this is the orphanage where the rubella vaccine was tested. And reading this as a young scientist, um, you know, testing a non-licensed vaccine product in this vulnerable, the, the most vulnerable population, orphaned children, I'm like, why? How, how could this, how could they have thought this was a great idea? But Meredith's book does a really great job of explaining the different context of science and the kind of wartime mentality of the greater good. And that was really um, a stark contrast from what the challenges we have today in terms of uh, patient recruitment. So today we struggle with uh, finding inclusive, informed patient cohorts. So this is a graphic from the uh, Precision Medicine Initiative cohort program. And the Precision Medicine Initiative was started under Obama, and it seeks to uh, sequence the whole genomes of about a million people. And I certainly remember when sequencing the whole genome of one person was a really big deal. So you can imagine that this is quite the ambitious undertaking. Um, but the aim of this uh, cohort recruitment program is to make sure that we're gathering patients that represent all of America, right? So lots of diversity in, obviously, gender diversity, economic diversity, racial diversity, cultural diversity, all more metrics than I can probably even name. Um, but that's, that's the challenge we face today in terms of cohort recruitment. The third challenge, or the third difference um, from science in the 1960s was that the face of science was mostly white, mostly male. There's definitely a few exceptions, um, but those really were exceptions. Today, we're getting a little bit more diverse. This is a picture of the lab that I work in. This is my big boss, Barney Graham. Um, and we're a pretty diverse group. Uh, we're from all around the country, all around the world. We speak many different languages every day. Um, but there's still a way to go. All you have to do is look at the hashtag YAM, which stands for yet another mostly male meeting. Uh, yeah, to see um, people take pictures of conference programs and post them, just to show how the distance we have to go yet. But we're getting better, so focus on the positive. Uh, so those are three differences that I really reacted to from the 1960s versus today. But there's one similarity that I think will be true until the end of time, that uh, technology really drives innovation. So the vaccine race did an amazing job of describing how, in the 1960s, human cells cultured in vitro led to some amazing innovation. The rubella vaccine, the polio vaccine, incredible. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about how structure-based vaccine design is leading to a vaccine for RSV. So uh, let's do an audience engagement exercise. So before Catherine's lovely intro, who here had heard of RSV, respiratory syncytial virus? Okay, lots of hands. What? Keep them up. Um, so keep your hand up if you are a new parent, i.e. your kid is under the age of two. Ah, okay, well, most, put your hands up if you're a scientist. All right, there we go, Th that's why. So um, in my regular life, so I'm gonna talk about uh, respiratory syncytial virus uh, vaccine development. Um, 
RSV, and I really like this infographic because RSV also stands for really serious virus. Um, but in my regular life, when I tell people I do RSV development, or RSV vaccine development, um, people either have no idea what I'm talking about or they have a young infant at home. Um, so the RSV burden of disease is really in the uh, very young infants under the age of one. Um, RSV, everybody gets infected with RSV by the time they're about two, but if you're very young and your lungs are very small, the inflammation that results from infection can be very serious. So. RSV is the leading cause of infant viral death, and RSV mortality is actually 10 times that of influenza for infants under the age of one. So you think about how we talk about influenza, we really focus on uh, the disease burden of influenza, but um, RSV is also a very worthy target of our efforts. So we've talked a little bit, I think this is uh, a little bit of uh, repetition from Meredith's talk, but uh, we talked a little bit about polio and rubella and RSV, these are all viruses and um, talking a little bit about what, what a virus actually is. And sometimes that's really difficult to define because viruses have large variation in structure, complexity, and ecological niche. So this is just an artist's rendering of all different types of uh, viruses. And uh, I think we saw this one previously. This is a phage. It has a really amazingly unique structure and uh, it infects bacteria. But now, um, let's look at some data. So that was an artist rendering. This is, these are actual electron micrographs of actual viruses. And you can see that poliovirus looks very different from Epstein-Barr and indeed looks very different from, from the other viral types. So in Meredith's book, um, she talks about how the scientists would actually look at the cell culture and see if viruses were present. And this is an example of data that would tell you, yes, there's a virus there, no, there isn't. And actually viruses can be classified according to how they look. Um, so a second point about viruses is they are non-living, which again makes them a little difficult to categorize. Um, they lack key metabolism and reproduction machinery, meaning that um, they need to infect cells in order to survive and reproduce. So there's a certain type of viruses that are enclosed by a membrane, and a membrane is just a water exclusion zone that some viruses use, that uh, human cells use um, to separate the inside from the outside. So here, this is a viral particle, also called a virion, and it contacts a host cell. So this, all this area is the host cell. So here's the virion. It makes contact with the host cell by way of these proteins on the outside of the viral surface. And then the membranes merge, and what was inside the virus is now inside your cell, and you're infected. So I just really want to emphasize that proteins on the viral surface mediate infection. In particular, this fusion protein mediates that infection process. Zooming in a little more, um, again, this is the surface of the virus, and up here is the surface of the cell. This viral protein is just hanging out on the surface of the virus, and then when it makes contact with the host cell, um, part, of the virus remain, part of the viral protein remains stuck in the viral membrane, but then the, the protein kind of does the splits, and, um, and now this protein is bridging both, both the viral membrane and the host cell membrane. And then there's a change in protein shape, which we can call a protein conformational change, and these two membranes merge and we have infection. So before infection, we have this pre-fusion conformation, and after infection, we have this post-fusion conformation. So infection is mediated by a, a change in protein shape. Proteins are very small. Um, this is a logarithmic um, scale showing different uh, things that we can see and not see. So with the human eye, we can see ourselves and um, hen's eggs, uh, but we have a little trouble seeing things at the cellular level. But then we have a light microscopes and electron microscopes to help us see uh, things that are much smaller. Um, so when we look here, this is where proteins are. And the difference between the size of a protein and the size of a virus is actually pretty similar to the difference between the size of an egg and to the size of a human. So if I'm a virus, this is a protein to give you a sense of scale. Um, it's actually rather optimistic that you could use electron microscopy to see proteins in great detail, um, but there's other techniques that um, we can use and I'll, I'll mention one a little bit later. The second point about proteins is that uh, proteins are polymers. 
And polymers are large molecules made of repeating units. So an analogy I like to use is a pearl necklace, where the necklace is the um, polymer, but the repeating unit is the actual pearl. And much like a pearl necklace, typically polymers are made of these repeating units that are very similar to one another, like these different pearls. So a lot of biomolecules are polymers. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit more about proteins that are made of amino acids, but carbohydrates are made of hexoses and pentoses. DNA and RNA are made of nucleic acids. You get the idea. Okay. So how to build a protein. So initially, these polymers are made of a linear sequence of amino acids shown here. But then they gain a little bit more complexity in three-dimensional structure in what we call secondary structure. And this is very similar to an increase in complexity when you have a series of letters versus a word. A word has a little bit more meaning. And then this secondary structure comes together to form tertiary structure, which is kind of like words coming together to form sentences. And then again, increased complexity when the tertiary structure comes together to form quaternary structure, much like sentences come together to form paragraphs. So there's increasing complexity as you go from linear sequence of amino acids to three-dimensional structure. So the problem is that the linear amino acid sequence of a protein is relatively easy to find. But we don't necessarily know the structure or the function of the protein. So if you can imagine a linear amino acid sequence as this ball of yarn. This ball of yarn could be a hat, which you wear on your head. It could be gloves that you put on your hands. You get the idea. Um, it could be a really amazing periodic table sweatshirt. That um, It's not mine, but I wish it was. Um, but just because you have the amino acid sequence doesn't necessarily tell you what the structure is. So returning to our viral proteins, the pre-fusion and post-fusion conformation of the protein actually have the same linear amino acid sequence. They're the same ball of yarn. And we don't know if it's going to be a scarf, hat, mittens, et cetera. We need more information. We need the structure to understand how RSV infects cells. So we asked Jason McClellan. <laughs> um, Jason is a very talented uh, structural biologist. The technique that he uses is called uh, X-ray crystallography, where you take proteins and you force them to form crystals, which is really tricky. And then you shoot X-rays at them, which is even trickier. And we use that diffraction to find the three-dimensional structure of proteins. It's pretty much wizardry, um, but Jason is really amazing. And he's currently at Dartmouth. But at the time, he was at the VRC. And um, he was able to show that the pre-fusion structure and the post-fusion structure are very different. So what I'm showing here are the pictures of the structures, but I want to reiterate that these are actual data. Every one of these little lines, little points, that's a, a place where an atom sits in space. And you can um, move these proteins around, you can take them apart, you can ask questions about how they interact with their environment or other proteins. So even though I'm showing pictures, these are it's actually very impressive data. Um, so Jason was able to show that the pre-fusion F and the post-fusion F have very different structures. And so even if you're not used to playing around with protein structure, um, you can see that the pre-fusion structure is kind of a little more, more squat, a little bit more um, condensed, versus the post-fusion structure is actually a little bit more elongated. And so we can annotate that by this red kind of mushroom and this longer kind of ice cream cone type uh, conformation. And so when we look at the surface of the virus, we can actually see these protein shapes. So this is the surface of RSV, and we zoom in even closer, and we see these shadows. And those shadows actually really closely align with the pre-fusion and the post-fusion conformation, which is amazing. And then we can ask, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so to reiterate, the pre-fusion molecule um, is here before infection, and the post-fusion molecule is here after infection. So we can ask about the function of this protein as well. And here we have a viral particle with um, pre and post on the surface. And it's, um, it's pretty infectious. But then as we decrease the amount of pre-F on the surface of the virus, we actually lose infectivity. So we have a lot of really interesting functional information about this protein. But really, how can we use protein structure to design a vaccine? We asked Joan. Uh, Joan is an amazing uh, post-baccalaureate uh, post scholar in the lab, and she asked some really interesting questions about RSV antibodies. 
Antibodies are molecules produced by the immune system in response to foreign material. So I say foreign because sometimes uh, you get antibodies against self, and, um, but here I'm only talking about foreign, uh, in response to foreign material. There's all different kinds of antibodies found in the blood. So what I'm showing are these, these Y-shaped molecules are the antibodies, and I'm trying to convey that they have all different specificity. Um, but uh, I'm only going to be talking about anti-RSV antibodies. Another uh, important point about antibodies is that they bind to specific regions of molecules, and those are called epitopes. So here, this is a piece of foreign uh, material that we can call an antigen, and there's specific shapes on the surface of this antigen that antibodies will react towards. So blue binds to circle, red binds to square, you get the idea. But if I were to cut this antigen in half and only have this top part, only the blue and the red would bind. The green, its epitope isn't, isn't there, so it couldn't bind. So antibodies are very specific for their epitopes. Even though you have all different kinds of antibodies in your blood, each antibody is only specific for that one epitope. So Joan was able to ask and answer some really interesting questions. First, even though the surface uh, of pre and post F, 50% of it is shared. Um, so they have actually, even though they have a very different kind of overall conformation, there's a central region that's shared by pre and post F. But when we look at antibody binding of RSV reactive antibodies, overwhelmingly they only bind to the prefusion part, or, or rather the prefusion conformation. So that was really unexpected. And um, in order to examine this in a little bit more detail, I'm going to talk about neutralizing antibodies. So. Some antibodies are able to prevent infection or neutralize the virus. So this could be in the context of uh, a lab assay um, on the bench, or maybe if someone like sneezes on the subway and the virus goes up your nose. Um, where if a virus is able to infect a cell, when they come into contact, you have infection. But if you have neutralizing antibodies, like here, the antibody is able to bind to the virus and then your cell isn't infected. Much happier. So this is all to say that um, in the case of rubella and indeed in the case of RSV, neutralizing antibodies are really important for uh, protection and is what we're, what we're trying to elicit uh, via vaccine development. Not all vaccines are like this. Um, I don't want to exclude any cellular immunologists out there, but in this case, um, antibodies are really important. And in fact, they are the heroes of our immune system in our story. Uh, not all heroes wear capes, but in this case, this one does. Okay, so when we look at uh, all the RSV antibodies, and by that I mean the pre-F and the post-F directed antibodies, we see a high degree of neutralization. But if we remove the prefusion specific antibodies, we see a low level of neutralization, meaning that removing prefusion antibodies removes the neutralization. Conversely, if we do the same thing and we remove post-F antibodies, we get that same high degree of neutralization, meaning that removing post-fusion antibodies doesn't change the neutralization. So really, this change in neutralization potency is due to the removal of pre-fusion antibodies, meaning that pre-fusion antibodies are highly neutralizing. So all of the data that I just showed was um, to do with Sera, or rather people that had been naturally infected. But now what I'm talking about is immunization, where if we immunize non-human primates with this prefusion molecule, we get high neutralization. However, if we do the same thing with post-fusion, we get poor neutralization. So vaccination with pre-F induces neutralizing antibodies in non-human primates. But the real question is, will prefusion induce protection in people? And the Vaccine Research Center is actually ideal, the ideal place to answer this question. Because what I've talked about a little bit today is the research arm, where we investigate vaccine concepts. But then there's these, all these other branches of the VRC. There's the engineering lab, the GMP pilot plant, the uh, vaccine clinic, and the immunology lab that are set up to be able to produce a candidate vaccine. And all of this work is done ahead of time. So by the time we're trying to attract an industry partner, you can imagine it's a much more attractive deal. So this is very exciting. The RSV 
Prefusion is undergoing a clinical trial right now. Um, I think we did our first injection a couple days ago. Um, so uh, what's really notable about this is that the Prefusion structure was published in 2013, and here it is 2017 into clinical trials. So that's really amazing. And again, a fourth difference from the 1960s where there's uh, really uh, an attempt to really fast track a lot of this stuff into the clinic um, to get what what we're developing in the lab to be actually be efficacious for the public. So the Vaccine Research Center doesn't just do RSV, but that's the story that I've told today. It does a numerous other uh, targets. And um, I think this is a, a really important point because um, really we've seen how technology drives innovation in the 60s and structure-based vaccine design is driving innovation today uh, in RSV and in some of those other viruses uh, and non-viruses that I uh, showed previously, but really what will drive tomorrow's innovation? And um, to give you even more motivation, I know we're all at ASM already, but um, emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases are getting to be, uh, there's more outbreaks worldwide. And so I think it's really important to feature these events um, where we can talk about science and hopefully come together to find some creative solutions. So with that, I'll use the amino acids to say thank you. Hello. I just had a question about uh, how the NIH receives funding. Do um, private companies invest in the vaccine research, or is it a combination of public and private? So um, the VRC is part of the intramural um, scientific division. So the NIH has an extramural, which funds research that you find at universities, um, but we're the intramural. So that's how a lot of this research is funded. In terms of the public-private partnerships, um, I think some of these products get licensed um, to companies. I don't think there's actually a transfer of title, if you will. But again, this is way above my pay grade. <laughs> Or do you want to, there's a mic here. <laughs> yeah. Having lobbed those two questions to you, I'd love to know more oh about okay. um, whether the whole cell method of vaccine, uh, yeah, wh why is that completely obsolete and why or why not? And then also what's going on with Ebola? Oh gosh, okay. So um, I'll, uh, okay, I'll just hold this. Um, so whole cell um, vaccines, I think there definitely was a heyday for those, but I think um, when you have a whole cell or a whole virion, um, you have a, a much more complex antigen environment. Um, and so I think what a lot of the focus is now is narrowing on specific epitopes that are, have the most efficacy. So that's what we did with RSV, was really narrowed in on not just a protein, but a confirmation of a protein, or maybe even specific epitopes. Um, so that's kind of my best estimation. I think you were um, correct in saying the technology has moved on a little bit uh, from the whole inactivated. But I don't want to rule it out completely. There certainly are some um, inactivated vaccines that are under investigation. Um, and your second point was Ebola. Uh, so uh, Ebola is definitely uh, still a concern, but I think it's in terms of um, developing and, and a vaccine and showing efficacy, but I think um, we're definitely focused on uh, Zika and on other emerging and re-emerging pathogens, um, including uh, Lassa, Nipah, and uh, MERS, which um, those in the vaccine development community, those were pegged as a um, targets to, to move the ball forward on. I think with Ebola, um, by the time vaccines were rolling out, the epidemic was waning, which was great um, for, for human cost, but in terms of testing efficacy, even though that was a very quick uh, vaccine to test timeline, it wasn't quick enough. So um, maybe that answers your question. Hello. Hi. Okay, so the pre and post fusion confirmations, envisioning how this is going to be produced down the line, do you have techniques that are going to be used to selectively 
you know, produce the pre-fusion confirmation? Are you going to try to isolate them? What's some of the technology that's going to be used? Yeah, so great question. Um, Jason um, was able to produce or able to identify specific mutations within the protein to be able to stabilize the pre-fusion confirmation. So when thinking about using that as a vaccine, um, using those stabilizing mutations means that the protein is then in the pre-fusion confirmation for people. Um, but there's other technologies where you might necessarily might not necessarily need to produce the protein itself, but maybe you could give someone um, the nucleic acid sequence and they could make their own proteins. Um, and with those specific mutations that Jason identified and others, you'd be able to do that um, in that context. Kizzy. Hi, April. Great talk. Hi. <laughs> um, so actually, I have two comments. Thank you. And then I have a question. Okay. The first comment was that the talk was awesome. Um, the second one is that um, just to kind of reply to your mm -hmm. question in the front about the moving onward with the technology. Um, some viruses, like RSV, for example, just in general with a live active infection that you can get from someone sneezing on you, et cetera, um, the immune system doesn't really mount a great response to it from a live real virus. So having a vaccine that would be even weaker and inactivated wouldn't necessarily be effective. So that's where you have to kind of get strategic and find the more effective epitopes and things of that nature. Um, so just fun fact, everyone in this room gets infected with RSV about every two years um, since you've been a baby. Um, so your, your immune system just doesn't mount a response to it. The question that I have for April mm. is that also in reply to your question, um, how do you think that we as vaccinologists, scientists, virologists, whoever, whatever you are, um, can get ahead of emerging infections similar to Ebola? I know that when um, President, o former President, sadly, Obama <laughs> came to the VRC, he made a statement about had only someone paid attention to Nancy Sullivan's um, vaccine product years ago, we would have been ahead of the epidemic. So what advice do you have for us in that regard, or perhaps even the government Ooh. in that regard? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kizzy. Um, so I think uh, it's, it's, I'm going to just it's about communication and coordination. I think, um, I don't want to get too political because I don't know who's watching, um, but uh, I think um, Tony Fauci definitely, um, I'm going to punt to his answer to this question, which is that um, protecting global health and increasing global health infrastructure is actually protecting American interests as well. Um, I was definitely uh, very concerned about um, some comments saying that um, health care workers shouldn't travel to Ebola-infected regions um, to protect American interests. Um, but I think stopping an outbreak, stopping a pen, uh, an epidemic at the site where it's causing damage um, means that uh, we're even much safer here. A wall will not stop a mosquito. Um, and so I think... Uh, isolation is actually more dangerous than coordination. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any more questions? <laughs> All right, um, can we have one more round of applause for our speakers? <laughs> So we're going to have a um, reception just outside, a uh, little bit of food and drink for you. Um, Meredith and April will both be available um, if you have any questions that come up or um, just want to talk to them about what they do. Um, and Meredith will be signing copies of her book, which we uh, do have for purchase, um, $30 credit or debit only. We can't take cash. Um, and you can just queue up at the table that's to the right of these doors um, if you're interested in that. All right, thanks so much for coming and watching if you're online. Once you're in the BSL4 space, the only way you can get out is to go through a chemical shop. It's an unusual room, never seen anything like this. 
Anybody who has access to this facility first has to go through an iris scan. So the HEPA filters filter the air coming out of the facility and that will remove bacteria, viruses, anything that might constitute any kind of risk, right? Remember this building is, is basically a second building inside the main building.